Thank you so much, Karen. Next, I want to introduce Bob Williams, a board member of the JLC, who is here to give us an idea of the tax benefits and relief we would experience in Delaware County if we um, could ever begin to develop our own natural gas. As a longtime environmental consultant, Bob Williams' wisdom, expertise, and commitment to educating folks around the state about these issues has been invaluable to our effort. As a member of As a member of Governor Andrew Cuomo's um, high volume hydrofracking panel, Bob has helped put landowner issues front and center in the most important places. I am so pleased to have Bob here today to take us through the pre this presentation. After Bob talks, we'll go right into Truthland and hold questions until afterwards when we'll have a panel of discussion. Um, okay, Bob, it's on to you. And um, ma'am, you cannot record this presentation. You can, you can record this. I don't care. That's Thank, you. Thank you. No, that's okay. That's okay. This, is, this is good information, and it's the information. I didn't make this information up. I'm on, as uh, Sam said, I'm on the uh, Governor's High Volume Hydrofracking Panel. And one of the things that happens is when we go to our meetings, we get presentations by different parts of the uh, state government, and most of the information that I have in here is directly out of the uh, presentation we got from the Office of Real Property Tax Services, and I just modified it to make it more personal to be my local, if I bring in some local information. Once again, this is me, Bob Williams, and I've had 40 plus years working as an environmental consultant. I've worked in over 32 different states, and I've worked on all types of energy projects, wind, fossil fuel, nuclear power, what else do I have? Natural gas and pipeline projects, and I've worked for energy companies, states, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So I've, been, I've got a lot of experience with regulations. I just put this slide in here because this is a slide of New York State, and the one thing that, that I hear a lot is that there's no natural gas drilling going on in New York State. Well, there's lots of natural gas drilling going on in New York State, and it continues to go on now as we, as we talk about the Marcellus Shale. All of the red areas that you see in here are areas of New York State that are, that are drilled and are being drilled for natural gas, and the oil, the oil is in the green area, and we have gas storage fields in the black area. But it's going on. Last year, there were over 300 well permits granted in New York State. The year before that, 300. The year before that, 500. So there's lots of natural gas drilling going on in New York State. So what's all this mean to the landowner and the town? So let's take, we're going to take a, a quick look at some of the typical things, the drilling site, the horizontal drilling process, the drilling unit, the pad, the number of wells on the pad, and the drilling sequence of each well, and the production value. The production value, you'll see, will be important as we go on. These are some pictures that I took that I actually got off the uh, internet from uh, Norse Energy up in Shenango, Madison County. This is the, I'm sorry, let me go back. This is the, this is the border between Shenango and Madison County, and there's several well pads here being drilled by Norse. This is a picture taken in 2010. Same area in 2012, you notice how it's been cleaned up quite a bit, and here's the same, a picture of one of the well sites, the same area. This last summer, I went up there and took a look around. This is a well site, and you can actually, if you look closely, you can see that it's right up there, in a, uh, right in this farmer's area. If you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't be able to find it. One of the other things I'm going to mention now, and I'm going to get back to a little later on, is that we also hear in the southern tier that there's no natural gas drilling going on in the southern tier, and no Marcella Shale drilling going on in the southern tier. Well, I'll tell you what, this is the New York State line right here. This is the town of Conklin. This is the Cardi well, which is 1.2 miles below the, below the state line. So we, we have natural gas drilling going on in the southern tier. It's very close. And there are wells that are closer to the border than this. The other thing that's interesting in this particular slide is this little line that goes up through here. This is the laser pipeline. And the laser pipeline goes up through the town that I live in, which is the town of Windsor, and it connects into the Millennium Pipeline. The Cardi well, which is right here, connects into the laser pipeline. All right, now we're going to talk about a drilling unit, and the drilling unit I'm going to put up is based on current New York State regulations. The, uh, the first thing we have is we lay it out, and right now in the New York State regulations for the Marcella Shale, or the Utica Shale, the largest, the largest uh, unit you can have is 640 acres, one square mile. So and that could be any shape, but this I've laid it out here a half a mile wide and two miles long. 
First, the drilling pad comes in someplace in it. Then a couple of wells will be drilled. And this, what I did is I put two wells on in year one. I put two more yell wells on in year two. And I put two more wells on in year three. Now, the only reason I did this is for the purpose of presentation is that current New York State regulations, not new regulations, but current New York State regulations state that once you start a drilling unit in New York State, you have to finish the drilling unit within three years. That's the current regulation. That's nothing new. So in this particular case, I just put the six wells on this particular drilling unit in three years. Now, they can drill the wells much, much faster than that. Some of the recent trips that I've made down in the PA, they're putting one of these wells in like in 16 days. It takes them a couple of days to move the rig. They put another well in 16 days. So they could actually finish this entire drilling unit in three or four months. Be done. In, out, gone. Drilling site. This is where it all happens. This is the drilling pad. This is where it all happens. This is where the stormwater pollution prevention plan and the spill containment plan are important. The years that I've been working on this, if there's a problem that's actually going to be associated with, with pollution from natural gas drilling, it's probably going to happen right here on the drilling pad. Not as a result of hydraulic fracturing, but as a result of somebody spilling something or something getting off the site. If the stormwater pollution pre prevention plan is done correctly and you have your spill, spill, spill containment people on site, if something gets spilled, it's going to be cleaned up before it leaves the site. And that's typically what happens. In the new regulations that are supposed to come out sometime in the near future, New York State has put in two stormwater plans you have, one for construction of the site and another for drilling of the site. And you have to have a trained spill containment team on site at all times when you're doing the drilling. So they've actually looked at this. There's a secondary containment, there's the, they have um, impermeable liners in here, they're working on top of a pad, they do once, once uh, closed loop drilling. They actually have this pretty much in sight. Typical, typical horizontal drill, they come down. Oh, hang on, let me go back. I'll, I'll figure out how to run this in a minute. Drill the uh, vertical leg and then turn and go out horizontally. The advantage of this, and this is a huge advantage and one of the things that the landowners are, have been in favor of from day one, we don't want them to drill 16 wells in a square mile. We want them to have one drilling pad, one access road, one pipeline, we want to be able to do that. That's why the horizontal drilling is important to us. We want to be able to have one well pad to cover that square mile area, one access road, one pipeline coming into that particular area. This really cuts down on the surface disturbance. And the surface disturbance is where it's all about. One stormwater plan, one spill containment plan. This is one of the things that is a problem, and it's what we hear about all the time. We're talking about issues that we hear about in PA of gas migration. And the vertical, this is a picture of a vertical well, but the vertical well and the horizontal well, the vertical step part is ex exactly the same. They put in several layers of uh, steel casing with concrete cementing them in place. And state regulations, these are New York State's existing regulations require that Wells be constructed in a method that prevents the movement of none, no gas, oil, or water from one zone to the other. That's the New York State regulation. Nothing new, nothing old. That's the current regulation. Each casing is string is reaches its cut, cement's pumped to the bottom, and it has to be pumped to the bottom enough to force it 25% back out on the surface. Current New York State regulations. This ensures that you got an integral impermeable seal of cement and steel that protects the aquifer. One of the things that New York State has that makes it just a little teeny bit different than every other state, but I think it's the uh, most important part of the whole regulation, when they're drilling one of these wells, they're putting a well in, whether it's a vertical well or whether it's a horizontal well, New York State has in their regulations, if you hit a, an area of shallow gas when you're drilling, and believe me when I tell you, when they're drilling, the drillers know every time they hit a gas show. They know every time they hit a gas show. If you hit an area of shallow gas in New York State, you are required to stop drilling, kill the well, call the DEC, DEC sends their engineers and they work with your engineers and they figure out together how you're gonna get past that area of shallow gas without contaminating the aquifer before you can go on. And that is a significant difference in New York State. And it's probably one of the reasons why in New York State you don't hear about gas migration issues. Although we, right now we have like 14,000 active wells in New York State, gas migration just isn't an issue. There. Not that it's never been gas migration, but I think the last documented New York State case was 
back in 1996 in Freedom, New York. I think that was the last, last case. All right, now what I came here to talk to you about, one of the things that happens when you're talking about environmental impacts is people always think that environmental impacts are negative. Well, I've written like hundreds of environmental impact statements in my last 40 years, and one of the things you're always supposed to address is you're all supposed to address positive impacts. Well, positive impacts, one of the positive impacts that we have with natural gas drilling in New York State is the ad valorem tax. Now, the ad valorem tax is a little bit different than taxes in some of the other states because the ad valorem tax is like a property tax. That means that the money that comes from the gas production, the gas well, the tax, in the form of taxes, stays local. It stays in the town, the county, and the school district that you live in. It's not a severance tax, and the landowners, the landowners have been very, very vocal about being against the severance tax in New York State, and the primary reason we're against the severance tax is we know that if we have a severance tax, the severance tax will go to Albany. And we might get some of it back, but not in this particular case. If you're gonna have natural gas wells in the town that we're in, I can believe it's the town of Sanford. If we're gonna have natural gas wells in the town of Sanford, we think we also should have the positive benefit of having the tax money here too. Ad valorem means according to value. It's taxed pretty much just exactly like your house is taxed. Your house is taxed based on the value. So for the purpose of a natural gas well, think of a natural gas well as a piece of property. On a five acre lot, the difference being to, this is your house over here. That owns, that's owned by you. This is leased by the gas company. Each entity pays their prospective property tax. The economic unit is based on the rights of the unextracted gas, all equipment and fixtures on a site, pipelines, compressor stations, equipment storage buildings, all of the above, plus all the wells that might be on that particular pad equals a production unit, a unit of production. Now the only thing that's a little bit different, we're gonna talk about this just a little bit later, is it's possible to have the pipelines and the compressor station belonging to another company. It could be a midstream company that owns that. And the pipeline that I showed you earlier on, the the one that goes up through the town of Windsor, the laser pipeline, that's a midstream company and they're bringing gas up from Pennsylvania. They pay property taxes different. New York State Office of Real Property Tax Service is responsible for producing the unit of production values. Your local assessor doesn't know this. He gets this information from the from ORPS. They send it to him. ORPS gathers information on the well data, royalties, gross income, expenses, the data is analyzed and normalized and a unit of production value is calculated for the new tax year and distributed to the town's assessor. Now here's where it gets just a little bit complicated, so it's, this, this is important to know. The unit of production value for the current, for the current year, for just this year, would be done by, you start with the sales price of the gas, you subtract the standard royalty, that's what the landowner would get, you subtract the overriding royalty, which might be what a land agent would get. He might be getting a half a percent or one percent. So you subtract those. That gives you the gross operating income. From that you subtract your operating expenses, reserve, depletion, dry hole. The same kind of the same kind of thing that any business would the cost of doing business. You subtract that from that. And that gives you the net cash flow which is divided by the discount rate. Now the discount rate is a very interesting number. And it's, imp it's an important number because what we have here, in order to get the unit of production value, we have a numerator, which is all the information up in the top. It's divided by the discount rate. The discount rate is 0 0.175, 0 0.175, it's always that number, plus the five-year average of the Federal Reserve rate, the five-year average. And that equals the unit of production value. Now that's still not the number that's going to go to the assessor. Because the assessor gets a number that is an average number. It's based on the average of the typical income, expense, and operating data for five consecutive years, going back six years from the preceding year and coming forward five years. Now it's really kind of easy to understand why they do it this way. If you're an assessor or a town supervisor or the town board, they do it this way because it gives you a flatter number. Instead of having the number peak up, drop down, peak up, drop down, as we all know right now, the price of natural gas is pretty low. The price of natural gas is pretty low. However, the ad valorem number that's, uh, they're like, sorry, the production rate number for this last year is based on 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010 numbers divided by five. 
And for the tax rates that went out where people who have natural gas wells on their property in New York State, the tax rate that went out this year is $9.80 per thousand cubic feet. That's the value. That is the value that went out that this year's taxes were based on. It's already been calculated for next year. For next year, it's $9.12. The price of natural gas has come down, so the rate came down, but it didn't drop all the way down based on the, the uh, $3 per thousand cubic feet that we have now because you have all these numbers added into it. So the numbers are added into it to smooth it out to make it so the towns can deal with their tax situation. There's another factor that comes in here. Now we got the $9.80. That's the value that gas is taxed at per thousand cubic feet. Now we have to figure out how many thousand cubic feet the wells are coming out. If you actually have wells on there, you actually get a production value from the gas company. But for the purpose of this presentation, I've used the numbers out of the uh, SGIS, the draft SGIS out of Chapter 6. They have a table, and the DEC projects that the first year of a Marcellus well in New York State will be 803 million cubic feet. The second year, it will drop down to 354. Then the third year, 258. Then it goes down to 201 and 166. And then it starts to level out, and it goes on like this for about 30 years up. So now what, the, uh, what happens is for assessing a gas well, the local assessor receives the value of unit production from the state. The local assessor computes the assessor using the following formula. He takes that by the production of the well and the equalization rate. And for one Marcellus well producing 803 million cubic feet, that is taxed like a piece of property that has a value of five and a half million dollars that first year. Now remember, it drops off, so the second year it would be less. Okay. And the third year would be less, but because it, it's based on production as well. And that is just for one well on a well pad. That's one well. Remember in the beginning we put six wells on? Well, we're going to get to that now. So we put six wells on. So what I did, I worked up a little table over, over three years for six wells. And what I did is I followed the same thing that I did in the diagram. I put two wells on in year one, each producing 803 million cubic feet of gas. And those two wells in the, the town that I work this up for, which is the town of Conklin, I showed you that on the figure before. They'd have county services would get $113,000, each different divisions in a town, 21 to town general, highway 24, lights 19, fire protection 13, and the school district would receive $401,000 for the two wells in that first year. And that's $594,000 total taxes out of two wells in the first year. Then if you put two more wells on in the second year, now what I did is just a, Keep this, keep this honest, I put two new wells on at the 803 million cubic feet, and I also decayed two of these wells to the 354. So we have two new wells and two old wells. This is year two, so now in year two we got 163,000 for county services, 30,000 from the town general, and you go right down, you can read these, 35 for the highway, and you get down to the school district getting $579,000 out of taxes in the second year. Then I went to the third year and I put on two more wells. Two new wells, two one-year-old wells, two two-year-old wells. So in the third year, it's $199,000 off that single well pad for the county, $37,000 for the town general, $42,000 for the highway, $34,000 for the light, $24,000 for fire protection, and $708,000 in that particular year for the school district. So you can see what happens out of these well pads is what you do is you get a lot of tax benefits that's coming into the local town from these things, and, it'll, it'll, and it drops off. It drops off, it'll go down, it'll go down, but it never goes down to zero until they actually plug the well. And that's one, so that's one square mile, that's one well pad, six, six wells on it. The, uh, the Cardi well, this well that I showed you right, this well pad that I showed you right here, that... Right, okay. just cut them off. <coughs> That, the Cardi well pad, anyway, well, well, Brad's trying to get that back up. The Cardi well pad has eight wells on it, and they're just south of the town of Conklin, 1.2 miles. So they're not getting any of the taxes from that well pad. If that well pad was 1.2 miles farther north, they'd be getting much, much more than that because that, they're only producing one well on the Cardi well pad right now, and the initial production out of that well is eight, 8 million cubic feet per day. Much, much more than the DEC's estimate. So how are we doing, Brad? Okay. Oh. <laughs>
All right, we're back. That well pad right there. Oh, let me go back one. Anyway, that well pad right there, this is the town of Conklin, and this well pad's right here. This is producing much, much more. One well on that's producing much, much more than all six wells that I had in my, in my demonstration. Anyway, the people of the town of Conklin are very acutely aware of what this would mean for their town. One other thing that I just, I'm going to bring into this is the town that I live in, I showed you the laser pipeline that went up through, and most of you people from here are aware of this. This is the Dunbar Compressor Station. It happens to be up the road from where my mom lives, about two miles. And I'm looking at it from about a mile away. The place that I'm looking at is from up on a hill where you come in the northern, northern part of Dunbar Road. It's the only place where you can actually see this compressor station in the road. It's fairly well positioned in that particular situation. But it's also in an area that is surrounded by other roads down through here. And there's housing on these roads. There's housing on these roads. And one of the things that our town did early on when we were getting ready for the, uh, we knew that the laser line was coming through. We knew they wanted to put a compressor station through. And a couple of things that you actually have some control over in New York State as a town is you have control over your road use agreement. You can come up with a road use agreement. You also can put in a noise ordinance. You put in a noise ordinance. And one of the things that we did in the town of Windsor is we put in a noise ordinance early on before this thing was even planned. And our noise ordinance basically, basically, you can actually go online, town of Windsor, and pick up the noise ordinance. But our noise ordinance basically says they can go five decibels over ambient. Five decibels over ambient. Well, to the credit of the laser people coming through, when we did that, they said, okay, we can do that. And they can do that. There's, a, there's enough technology out there that they're capable of doing that. So we put this in. So five decibels over ambient in this area right here, the ambient, it makes it 45 decibels. Now, when the, uh, when the DEC last February went through and actually did a sound measurement here, they actually came, they actually came back with their sound measurements, the nearest receptor, the nearest house, which would be this one right here, of 47 decibels. That's not quite quiet enough yet. So the people at the laser sold their pipe with this compressor in the pipeline to Williams Gas, and Williams Gas now is in, the, is in the process of making this quieter so that they can actually meet the town's ordinance. They don't have a problem with it. They can do this. They can meet the town's ordinance. The reason we put the ordinance is really simple. If you were going with a FERC line, you'd be looking at 55 decibels. We put the noise ordinance in because we in the town thought that 55 decibels might be a little bit too loud, so we put in the noise ordinance five decibels over ambient, they agreed to it. And some of the things that they did here, this is, this is where all the noise of the compressor station comes out. It all comes out in the cooling fans and everything in the back. And one of the things that they did recently is they put this little bit of insulation on that uh, exhaust thing. And that lowered the, dec that lowered the decimal rate about three, about three dB. But they're still working on it. They're going to get it there. One of the things, the reason they're probably going to get it there is my information is that they actually want to put more compressors in there. And it just wouldn't be possible unless they got the noise in there. But here's one of the things that's kind of interesting. The laser pipeline and the compressor station. The laser pipeline and the compressor station in the town of Windsor, when they put it through, they did not offer, ask for a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes. They said, we're going to pay whatever the taxes happen to be. And the taxes on this compressor station are fairly substantial in our town. The full value of the compressor station is $38.5 million. The assessed value is $26 million. County taxes paid every year by that compressor station, 268,000 to the county, 102 to the town, and to the school district, almost $700,000 every year based on the pipeline and the compressor station. So that compressor station and the nine miles of pipe that's associated with it pays to our town and county and our school district over a million dollars a year in taxes. That's a positive impact. Because that makes a pretty that makes a huge difference in the area that I live in. We live in a poor area and it's a poor school district. That makes a huge difference to the property owners. The last thing I have in here is one of the things that I hear on the advisory panel all the time is that there's no money available to pay for the regulatory staff that the DEC is going to need. And I brought this up to and the, they have this information on the advisory panel. And this is just some information that I know about around here. In this particular area, these are locations and these are acreages that have already been leased. Now, keep in mind that the Joint Landowners Coalition of New York, 
virtually almost all of our land that we have in the Joint Landowners Coalition is unleased. This is land that's actually already been leased. In Tioga County back in 2008, they leased 61,000 acres for $2,000 an acre, and uh, after nine months they dropped, they got $500 payment, but, and they never came back and got the rest. So they dropped that. So the 61,000 acres that they leased, $30 million came in, New York State income tax, New York State income tax paid at 7%. $2 million to the state already. The state got that $2 million. Right here, Sanford Winds area, 50,000 acres at 2411, $120 million total. $8 million in revenue to the state. West Windsor, recently, at uh, 2,600 acres, another $7 million, another half a million dollars to the state. Town of Maine, 3,400 acres, six. $6.8 million, another $470,000 to the state. Just recently in Conklin, they got the rest of their uh, lease payments, another $6 million, another half a million dollars to the state. In West Windsor, another 2,000 acres recently leased, $5 million, another $350,000 to the state. So just very close to us in this area, the state has already received over $12 million in revenue and in income tax. So when people say there's no money available, to pay any of the regulators coming in. I'm, I'm telling you, there's money available. And they already have a lot of it, and they have had to do no regulatory input on anybody's property as a result of it. So these are things that you want to keep in mind. Someone says, there's no money to pay the to pay the regulators. I would actually tell you that the landowners who have already been leased have paid money in that can't pay the regulators. So what's this mean finally for us in the southern tier here? It means thousands of jobs for New Yorkers, millions of money, millions of dollars in lease bonuses, millions of dollars in royalties, millions paid in sales taxes of the county in New York State, millions in state income taxes, millions donated to local charity, and decades of property prosperity for our area around here. So that's the end. Thank you very much. to let everybody know we've got some new signs if anybody wants to grab one on your way out to put in your lawn or hang up on the edge of your barn or whatever. Huh? Yeah, um, next we will be showing Truth Land. It's a 35 minute uh, film featuring Shelley Depew a Montrose mother, grandmother, and farmer, a longtime friend of the JLC president, Dan Fitzsimmons, who recommended her for the role. Enjoy the show, and afterwards we'll address yeah. questions from Bob's presentation as well as the film. Yeah. Can't, you're not going to have any questions yet, or what? No, Are you, at the end of the truth line. After the end? Oh. Yeah. You can get this movie.